feet and uh, yeah thanks feet and uh welcome everybody um thank you for spending this next 45 minutes with us uh like pete said we are talking about overcoming costs of digital transformation through devops um, I'm Mon Miri Ray, but you can call me Mon. Um, and yes, I, I am part of the GitLab APAC team, um, part of the customer success team, uh, specializing in MLOps and DevOps. So, um, what are we talking today? How are we spending this time? So, firstly, we're going to talk actually a little bit about why is this even a topic today? Um, and what is really digital transformation? And then relating it with uh, costs, so the whole power of actually making it cheap and a case study for it, the economic lens of digitization, and then little bit tips and tactics through DevOps in that digitization and cost strategy, and then holistically simplifying with GitLab. So let's start with why are we talking about this. To actually uh, unravel that, I do want to actually start that with um, a story. And um, this goes back to actually 2018. And it was a room full of people where um, it's um, an uh, economist, technology economist, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, who's got that picture on that top top right. Um, and then there was, um, I think the Google um, a chief uh, AI um, economist, as well as the Microsoft and the Obama digital transformation advisor. They're all in this room in 2018. And, uh, and really, really unraveling, um, you know, what does AI uh, mean to the society? Uh, what is digital transformation? Uh, how do we actually make development of software better? And Professor Daniel Kahneman, um, he uh, basically ends that um, conference with this story. And the story goes like this. A well-known novelist wrote me some time ago that he's planning a novel. The novel is about a love triangle between two humans and a robot. And what he wanted to know is how would the robot be different from the individuals? And I propose three main differences. The first one is obvious. obvious. The robot will be much better at statistical reasoning. The other one is that the robot would have much higher emotional intelligence. Now that's a tricky one because we think we humans have a better emotional intelligence. But the way Professor Kahneman was saying is in the way that, let's say uh, we want to understand human faces, recognition. There are a lot of things that the computer uh, can pick up quite faster than we as humans can pick up. So that's how he, what he meant by emotional intelligence. Now the third one is, the one that we are going to spend a lot of time on is a tricky one, is that a robot would be wiser. Wisdom is spread. Wisdom is not having a narrow view. That's the essence of wisdom. It's broad framing. And robot will be endowed with broad framing. Um, and I really do not see why, when it has learned enough, it will not be wiser than we people because we don't have broad framing. We are narrow thinking, we are noisy thinkers. It's very easy to improve on us. So this whole next part of this um, presentation, we will focus a lot on how we as humans are narrow thinkers, are noisy thinkers, and how we can use digitization to actually improve upon that. So to first focus on actually the narrow thinkers, um, the noisy thinkers, the humans, how we actually go about the process of any uh, changes or any transformation. So it's basically to three different areas, judgment, action, and decision. Um, I'm going to take a little bit example and relate it to digitization um, through this way. Uh, so the first is... Um, 
formerly uh, machines, uh, they uh, enhance human productivity. Uh, and it was uh, in the first era, in the 90s of the digitization movement, a um, lot of the manual tasks has been done by um, uh, done by the uh, computers or, or through the digitization journey, and humans actually do the mental tasks. The era of digitization we are right now, it blurs that line between that physical and mental task. So, for example, if a bank is uncertain whether a credit card charge is fraudulent or not, uh, the bank compares the payoff by refusing the legitimate charge to, uh, to the payoff from approving a fraudulent charge. Now, judgment is the process that we as humans first look at it and we put that judgment in that process or in the computer decision making. So um, in simple cases, we can actually have it all automated. In complex cases, when that digitization process cannot add value, then the decision makers cannot just use judgment, but will choose that action given in a best result on average. Uh, so then there's some tasks that require judgment that's a switching railway trades that can be automated. And as automation proceeds, machines can substitute for humans and hence starts slowly, slowly that journey of transformation. So so to actually look into what is digital transformation, uh, the value of digital transformation, it is a movement that gets us closer and closer every day to almost automated decision-making by enabling precise judgment and anything automated substitutes something manual and has the power of being cheap. So the power of being cheap. Um, trends towards these cheaper capabilities, it has impacted businesses, models, entire industry, all through. Um, obviously a good example is internet, which is an example of recent innovation. Um, it has made everything from communication, distribution, research, research, everything cheaper. But what does that actually mean to this current digitization of software development cycle? Now to empower that, I want to go through that example of um, cell phones. So mobile phones, uh, it, it, the whole journey actually started in the 1960s to 1980s where Motorola actually led the industry. Um, they were prototyping and working to find a way to turn military style radio phones into consumer devices. So 1983, almost 4,000 US dollars, Motorola, Dyna, TSC. That was considered revolutionary. In 1990s, we, um, we focused on making cell phones more affordable, reducing the cost through service contracts. And came the era of the Motorola Micro Tag, which was $3,000, to, to then all the way to, uh, uh, in 1993, the $900 Simon Personal Communicator. Then 2000s is what we call the smartphones develop, which is taken away from uh, actually a term called dumb phones. Uh, and it's all about changing, not only helping with your current strategy of communication, but changing the way you look into communication. Um, and then further in 2010 and future, that smartphone totally, totally not just is developed, but it evolves to what we have currently is I forget the number of iPhone, but iPhone 11 to $1,100, where um, it's constantly, constantly developed and evolved. This is a classic example of digital transformation where you actually take, make things affordable. Once things are made affordable, there is a drop in cost. Everyone starts using it. And once everyone starts using it, innovation gets better and better. And the whole strategy of how you do a current software um, it, is changed um, with time. So that goes to the economic lens of DevOps. Um, a certain price drop on something means more consumption. So let's say if there's a drop in price of tea, people buy more of tea, 
less of coffee and everything that complements that, um, like sugar and milk, is, is, is bought more. So what does that actually mean for a lot of different um, uh, technology? So for mobile phone, like we saw, it was a drop in price of communication. For AI, it's a drop in price of machine prediction. For DevOps, it's a drop in price of transaction cost within teams that helps in redrawing the boundaries to create cross-functional teams. And the sugar and milk for DevOps is actually technology, automation, and human judgment. So now I'm going to take AI, DevOps, mobile phones, and talk what does that mean for digitization, the economic lens of digitization. It is the drop in price of decision making. And when digitization is framed as cheap decision making, its potential um, becomes very clear. So then digitization is at the heart of making any decisions under uncertainty. It increases productivity. So whether it's operating machines to handling documentings, to communicating with stakeholders or customers. And uncertainty has always constrained strategy. So better digitization creates opportunity for new business structure and strategies to compete. So now that we have a little bit more understanding of what we uh, consider the digital transformation um, from an economic lens, from a price lens, from uh, what on the core value it is, so drop in the price of decision making. We wanna go a little bit more as to understanding what does that mean for DevOps. So in GitLab, um, we, um, and a lot of different people have a various ways of looking at this infinite loop, but DevOps is an infinite loop. Um, it starts with the planning uh, and goes all the way to monitoring to various cycles and stages of development and operationalizing where each part of that cycle is managed. The development is fully secured and every step of that operationalization fully, fully defended. Um, and through this process, everything is orchestrated and, and there is a balance between choice and control. Now, with this understanding of DevOps, before we actually go into uh, the next phase of our, um, of going into the best practice of digital transformation DevOps, we will actually have some polling questions to understand where we are, where we are at our, as an audience in the journey of DevOps, um, what are uh, the challenges we are facing and, um, and how are the team structures? Uh, so, we, uh, so Tim is going to actually have this polling uh, part ready and we will give everyone a minute to be able to uh, vote for it. Um, I see people still uh, voting, so I'll give a few more seconds. Yeah, I think we can end the poll. 
here. All right. So, um, all right. So we have the results of the poll. Um, and the, uh, and the questions were, um, keeping your teams aligned and working on the right things at the right time can be challenging. How many tools do you have to use to understand their current status? Um, so 25% said one to two, 40% two to five, 13% greater than five, and then 23% uh, not sure. Um, and then which challenge, in the, uh, which challenge in the DevOps process do you feel takes up the majority of your resources to solve currently? And 40% has said manual complex processes that slow development. So I want to actually go into then part of my um, second, uh, part of this whole strategy of we totally agree with the poll results. So currently where, where the software cycle is, um, we love tools. And uh, we keep on uh, looking into various different tools to do various different tasks. Uh, but humans, remember, we are noisy thinkers. We are narrow, noisy thinkers. It is too hard to integrate all of that and understand all of that. So yes, the last decade, we have spent a lot of time buying a lot of tools, buying a lot of software, but that comes with the technical depth integration dilemmas, understanding different processes, different languages to understand the way the tool comes, and that comes with a cost. So there is multiple um, silos of teams, tools. Um, there is, like agreed, 40% is still a lot of manual work. There's repeated work. Um, there's a lot of waiting time. Um, then there is also a lot of legacy systems. Um, and that is where we are currently at the software cycle. Um, and so to be able to actually use automated decision making um, and reduce the cost, we need to figure ways to simplify our tool cycle, uh, flatten it across various teams, be able to scale things easily uh, go away from the manual work to automated work and be able to monitor it all through every stage of those DevOps life cycle and then have it all defended with uh, security through all processes so that doesn't become a later stage. And in GitLab, we believe that we can have it through single application, fewer hands off, fewer integrations, faster built in automation, higher quality of your code to, to your process and a security built in. Um, now for the next couple of actually slides, I do wanna go through um, uh, how in GitLab we actually enable that a little bit more in deep through all these different phases. And to do that, I wanna start actually with um, uh, looking into the old, old expensive way to cheap ways and how we actually do that. So silo team to cross-functional team, monoliths to microservices, manual test and release to automated test and release, manual configuration to infrastructure as a code, team defining tooling to tool standardization and annual release to frequent releases. So from a higher and broader strategy, these are the things that actually make digital transformation through DevOps cheaper. But to even start beginning that, there are little tricks that one gets better and better in that digitization journey. The first simple trick is changing a communication experience. This might seem very simple and very, very trivial, but there has been so much, so much cost uh, that goes into time as well as cost in just sending each other emails. So this is just an example of Slack and it's great. Um, it, it actually helps in open and inviting collaboration. There is a balance of asynchronous and synchronous. Um, you can have themes to actually get the right audience, have topics uh, set accordingly, but little steps like that helps in the visibility, uh, the collaboration and the transparency in communication. 
The next part is moving from actually private to shared documents. So similar kind of concept as communication, where it's open agenda, meeting collaboration, everything documented, but actually shared. Um, shared globally um, with, with anyone in the team or organization, but having these little, little practices gets you better and better every day, dialing up the accuracy of digitization. This um, is an example of now we go into uh, ideation of a project. So if you have a software, you start to build with. Uh, when we start building that, having the use of um, boards across teams. Um, and in GitLab, uh, we have the Scrum or Kanban boards. And then assigning and ideating, uh, having the idea, and then assigning different tasks to the idea, having the right alignment with groups, whether we call um, and having subgroup layers to give, uh, give visibility as well as giving ownership of tasks and having clarity about it all across the organization is key to digitization and dropping that cost. So later, there is no um, need of repeated work or not understanding on that alignment, um, confusions, uh, and everything that goes with not having your strategy of your software structured through a very simple process of having boards. The next is a part of what we are also uh, going through. So we are part in the middle of a global pandemic. And I think right now, uh, GitLab has been a remote company for, uh, for a while now. Um, uh, and it's always been a remote company and I think it's the largest remote company, but this is something that everybody's embracing now, uh, being in the middle of the global pandemic. So having seamless development is also important. So whether it's a project that you do, um, being able to uh, have GitLab at home versus office to an agency, having the project import export archives, um, features that you could develop anywhere um, and includes artifacts, context. Um, something in GitLab we do is we license users and not instances. Again, Similarly, it's, it's all about giving people the flexibility to be able to seamlessly develop no matter where you are. And then with through APIs, which is again key to digitization, being able to automate these processes by setting times, uh, schedulers when projects is exported or imported, all a part of just the fundamental basics before you ideating a software. So communication, having the infrastructure to be able to code anywhere. Now that we've actually had a good understanding of little tips on communication, uh, seamless development, um, then we go into actually the process uh, of GitLab. It's a single application that once goes from planning to monitoring where every part of your test and task that you've put on your board of creating and verifying and packaging of software is all version controlled. Um, every part of it is log tracked and it is automatically seamlessly orchestrated through the GitLab CI pipeline that goes straight into the releasing of the software to deploying it to then configuring and as well as then monitoring the logs of every step of the way, whether it's through the cycle analytics or, or how, how you've gone from uh, productivity to uh, scaling it um, or, or, or monitoring through secure, for security as well. So that starts the starting of the software journey where every part of it needs to be automated uh, harmoniously integrated, but also have governance and control and visibility with every step of the way version controlled. We've talked about a little bit of how, how we actually go about the communication, then the development and a little bit on end to end application that is harmoniously put together. But when we go about actually building, building, building the software, we all know about MVP, which is minimal viable product. But through this digitization journey, we have started appreciating 
even less than MVP, MVF, minimal viable features. And in GitLab, we believe that you can go even lesser, which is minimal viable changes, which basically means that every little, little change can add value. You can actually govern that, understand those different changes very quickly, um, and not 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 depend on annual uh, or the final MVP that that's already built, but little little changes that you can fastly actually look into it, as well as QA it and redo things very fast than to actually wait wait later once the MVP is kind of done. This not only helps in actually the drop in cost, but also unlocks the velocity and, and makes things go in, in timeframes um, much faster uh, from, uh, with frequent releasing. So again, moving from that concept of MVP to all the way to minimal viable changes. Now, all through this whole process of unified development, um, pipelines, having these orchestrated pipelines where everything is synchronously um, integrated is again key. So we've talked about these different stages. Uh, we've talked about the Kanban board uh, communication. We've talked a little about the seamless development, these minimal viable changes, version controls, but all of this needs to be harmoniously integrated. This is an example of all the different phases that a software went through from building, preparing, to testing, post-testing and post-cleanup, uh, all the various treatment that any part of those little tasks can be actually triggered as well as tested. And if you need to actually not go to the rest of the cycle and stop it based on a certain bug or a certain vulnerability, that needs to be actually have visibility and orchestrated. So pipeline for every minimal viable changes, pipeline for every commit that helps with that automated testing, security scans, continuing scans, configuration, deployment, and later, um, this pipeline can be extended into what we call assembly lines, which is again key to automation because one time you might be doing a software application, which is just a, 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 a bunch of Java rules. Then that might be extended into, let's say, an AI application or a prediction engine. And so this pipeline is key where you make it easy automated and extended into every different application based on what you need. So it can be extended to DevOps, to DevSecOps, to MLOps, to data ops, every part of that operation that needs to be integrated and have visibility all throughout. We've talked a little of security in the pipeline and security is paramount. Um, now there is a concept that there is um, once you build, build a software or it's in the MVP phase, and then it goes to the security team to actually get a better understanding of your code, your containers, and your scans. That causes repeated work. That also causes frictions and misalignments. So having security a part of when you're doing the minimal viable changes is really, really key. So having that in every little commit in GitLab, we have this SAS, DAS, dependency scanning, container scanning, and license management for every little, little change of the code that you do. So later, when a team is actually in that stage of almost bridging between development and production, you're not actually wasting time of figuring out of the container that you didn't scan or, or, or the code that needs different sort of scanning and the security team is, um, uh, uh, and the developers have a lot of friction on it. So having that auto, automatic security, a part of your code is again, a, a key. Um, the other part is, uh, which is very, very important is having a sense of review. Um, of or a sense of imagination of what your your what you're developing, what it actually might look in production, and uh, so starting small and then keep on reviewing with all the different changes of how your little review impacts the larger larger picture. So review apps are key to actually help in that transformation and 
automatically help in building those softwares. Um, again, a simple thing, but very, very key to, to this transformation uh, journey. We've talked a little bit of actually going uh, code as a infrastructure, but why is this really, really important at this stage? Um, the way we do software now, we, we're not only building one or two software, we are building, um, we have uh, billions and billions of lines of codes written uh, at, in, in total uh, on a yearly basis. So, uh, and, and it's just gonna get scaled and scaled and scaled more. So having code as an infrastructure, packaging it, makes it just easier to deploy, whether you're doing uh, in, in, in Canary or whether you're doing it in Kubernetes, but having a concept of actually packaging and containerizing it. Uh, so it's just easy, it's just a shift, uh, shift from development to production or deployment makes things a lot more easier. So that is again, fundamentals of dropping the cost in the digital transformation journey. So we've talked about the whole process and everything. Now, the other part is monitoring um, and having insights into every stage of the cycle. So there is developer insights um, that goes into, you know, how your code is doing, how you are, what, what about your repository contribution charts, but then there is productivity insights into, you know, when, when is your code getting reviewed? Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, what, what about the, uh, your group analysis? Who are in your groups? How many times are they pushing codes? Similarly with your operation of your application. So whether it's environments, community environments or, or any sort of dashboards that helps with through that monitoring of, um, from the planning stage to the defending stage. And then you need security reports, which goes into vulnerability and container scannings and how you're performing on a daily basis. These sort of insights helps better in your roadmap of actually understanding how well, where, where, what part is time consuming, what part is expensive, what part can you improvise. Very, very key to actually getting better and better in the digitization journey and dropping the cost proactively rather than reactively. So similar insights across all missions, these are all the various kinds of dashboards that you can get from roadmaps to canvas to your CI CD to productive to groups and projects insights, all of that put together. So, so to link and sum it up as to the little techniques that we've seen. <coughs> We have cost saving strategies um, to, that helps with flattening it, scaling it, automating it, monitoring it. Sorry about that. Um, <coughs> um, mon <coughs> mon <coughs> mon <coughs> I'm just gonna take a little bit of a water break. Sorry about that. Um, so we've looked into these different strategies of scaling it, automating it, monitoring and defending it. And to, to look into the techniques that we've seen through DevOps, just a summary of what we saw is using boards for collaboration, scaling, scaling easy with infrastructure as code, automating using your CI pipelines, which extends to security, to assembly lines, to to um, machine learning, to whatever part of the journey you are at your software cycle. Monitoring it through uh, log tracking, visibility, and insights across all missions, and defending that through security through every step of the way. Now, these are the, all the tactics that one can use. Um, in GitLab, this is all done through one software, it's not three, four different tools. Um, we've had 
people poll that I hey, use, um, I think it was 25%, use more than five tools, and that can be very, very confusing, and it's hard to integrate. In GitLab, we believe that you can do it all through this one single application where a developer, a security person, a product manager, they all can speak the same language without, without wondering if there is friction or misalignment and it, the software can be synchronously, seamlessly developed. And then similarly, in Git, we use GitOps to actually reduce that friction. This is just an example of what we talked about that once you have your task aligned, the, a developer creates the issue, creates a merge request, you commit your change that triggers the CI pipeline. Once you've done the change, the app is reviewed, and then there is a discussion you can have with, your, uh, with the product owner, scrum master, QA engineers, your changes are approved and it goes into the delivery cycle where every step of the way is monitored. This is how one can actually help with those simplifying, flattening, scaling, automating, monitoring, defending, uh, cost-saving strategies. So all in all, to reduce that technical debt, concurrent DevOps is what makes it happen. So there are three ways of looking into it. Um, concurrent DevOps is visible. Um, everyone knows what, what is happening at what stage. It is um, not synchronous. So you can manage and improve your cycle time. Um, it's efficient. So it, there is no handover time. So people can work immediately and it's governed all through the way uh, to make it simplified and, and you can act with certainty, which is the key to digital transformation. So cheap, almost automated decision-making where you can act with certainty with every part of it governed. So with that, I would wanna put it all together back to actually um, where we started. So, we started with a very futuristic person on uh, Professor Daniel Kahneman and his story. And then we went through a little bit journey on little ticks, uh, tips uh, in the DevOps cycle one can use to actually uh, help drop that cost. Um, but there is some sort of a dissonance still in, 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 in in every every software development cycle, um, in one hand you have you know autonomous cars, you have Siri, um, um, and they feel they are a little bit more advanced. They've proven the point of uh, of digitization, but um, and then you have the futuristic people. But there is no way there is still a struggle in reconciling this and using these technologies in our everyday life in our everyday work and so there is a dissonance in these two different thoughts of minds and the way i would like to end it is that that goes back to the ops of digital transformation which is nothing but a thesis of time so the more you dial up, it's like a knob. So the more you dial up the accuracy of digital transformation, the cheaper your current strategy becomes. And this is not just for Google and Microsoft and Tesla's, Netflix. This is just for everybody. And once you get better and better at it, um, you not only execute the current strategy, but you actually reinvent a new strategy, uh, like we saw in mobile phones. It reinvented, the smartphones reinvented the way we look into communication. So for example, um, if let's say the Amazon recommendation engine, uh, right now it's 20% accurate. Uh, once you've bought three uh, pairs of sneakers, it can recommend you uh, right one. So it's around 20 to 30% accurate. Um, and let's say it gets more data and then it gets more automatic um, and it, the infrastructure gets better and better. Um, and the accuracy um, dials up to 95%. 
And instead of, uh, once it gets to 95%, now what can happen after that? So theoretically, hypothetically, Amazon can then decide that they can ship you the shoes before you buy them. And then you choose if, um, if you want to keep it or not. Now, that's a hypothetical situation, but that actually shows how you actually not only help with your current strategy, but you actually reinvent that strategy. So with that, I do want to conclude that at the end, digital transformation, uh, there are tips for DevOps, but it is a thesis of time and it is about humans, how we want to use and enable us uh, with all the existing technology to creatively reduce the cost to this journey together. And so that's it for me. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and uh, your feedback is appreciated. So there is a link to it. Uh, I will post that on the chat. Um, and uh, and I'm up for questions. Hey, Mon, Peter here. Thank you so much for presenting that. We do have um, three questions that have been asked throughout the, the webinar. Um, so first question from um, Eldrin is how to, how to reduce the learning curve uh, for the teams on CICD? How to reduce the learning curve? Yeah. Um, I think it, it again starts, uh, starts, with, uh, starts with first small. Um, firstly, understanding um, where where your tool uh, where where your team is currently at. Um, now, the CI/CD tool. Uh, what kind of diff different people are are part of it? So, the CI/CD might will feel very different to to a security, to a developer, to even a machine learning scientist. So, having a common line, having a common language that can actually help contribute. So a single tool, single application is a good start and having minimal viable changes when you are enabling uh, that education is again a good start. So, um, so flattening it, uh, simplifying the tool process of it and being able to integrate it into their current ecosystem of, of tools as well. Right. Second question from Amar is, um, is the code analysis quality supported for different programming languages um, like MATLAB? MATLAB? Um, yes. Um, so um, happy to share that as well. Yes, the code analysis is, um, uh, we do uh, support a lot of different languages uh, through it. Um, from uh, uh, from it's uh, we do support uh, obviously um, Ma um, MATLAB uh, not yet for it. Uh, it's also based on how many people are actually using it. So uh, it, it it depends on what you're using for. So if let's say you're using MATLAB for machine learning, um, there is uh, it is not a plugin, but we can actually have that as a part. Uh, uh, embedded, uh, but in general, let's say if you're a Python coder, a Java coder, a Go coder, that's all a part of that plugins. Great. Um, next question is, how does code analysis compare with the likes of uh, SonarCube uh, and Synopsys? How is the vulnerability database maintained and how often is it updated? Yeah, good question. Um, so um, uh, the uh, uh, the so we are our, our code ana analysis is open sourced. So it's based on everything that is open sourced. Um, it is updated um, on a regular basis. So it it, it is all automatically updated. Um, pretty much instantly uh, based on the open source resources as well. So, um, and, and then it, it is reviewed uh, reviewed uh, as well on an instant ba basis. So it is a part of our CI CD pipeline and, and the review and the updates are pretty much instant. Right, we've got a few questions or a few people have asked um, about the recording of the webinar. So yes, it is recorded and uh, the link will be shared. Um, along with the slides. A couple more questions, Mon. Um, do we need to check in all dependencies for automated build or can you get it from package manager? We can get it from package manager. Great. Um, and another question, does a CI CD 
features require additional components or plugins for .NET core applications? Uh, we do support .NET. Uh, you do not need any other plugin for it. Uh, so uh, our web ID and our CI CD can actually handle that. Yep. Okay, great. Um, and we've got a question from Nikhil about um, interactive. Is, is there an interactive learning uh, section part of GitLab or a GitLab tour? Um, and Glenn's responded um, to that. So Glenn will reach out to you in terms of, um, I guess, further um, knowledge sharing. Um, and anyone else that's interested, um, we can also send you some, some links and details on that as well. Um, yep. There's another question. Um, how would you recommend an older vintage developer to start adopting CICD? When I started learning, even test-driven development um, wasn't a thing. And now it is hard to get, uh, get the time to go back and relearn these uh, new foundations. Um, I think, uh, well, firstly, um, it's, um, uh, I want to answer it by saying it, it's a little bit easier to be honest. So, um, I've been a data scientist and I don't know the, um, I don't know neural networks as well as, you know, my, my, my grandma or actually my dad as well. And, um, but I know how to apply it. So I think, um, your your experience is actually very key because you know the fundamentals but once I, I think there is like maybe a little bit more on the experience that is a lot different so that might take a little bit of that learning curve of like a month of actually understanding what is that application but once you get that you're probably a lot more more in a better place than than any of us and i think a uh, lot of these tools they are um whether it's ci cd or any it is getting more user friendly so it is time to adhere to audiences that are not just developers uh so it is also changing the the way one actually enables and uh, understands so you're mo much more closer to the journey than any of uh, any uh new school people um to actually understand and get better and learn it faster um but um one key thing i would probably um kind of say uh is um instead of actually uh a lot of the courses that we, uh that that there are, they go straight into the application rather than actually the fundamentals. Uh, just knowing that full fundamentals of CICD can sometimes help as well. And if needed, we I, I can recommend courses as well. Great, yeah. thanks. Thanks for that, Mon. Um, and then the final question, is there, a, is there a good set of resources to get started in, uh, with trialing and, and uh, prototyping GitLab? Um, yes, uh, so uh, absolutely. So GitLab is all um, uh, all uh, transparent. So we have an unfiltered uh, YouTube channel um, that ha goes through a lot of different techniques, uh, a lot of different how do you actually start with GitLab. Uh, we have a full, very uh, transparent handbook as well that goes a lot detailed. It depends on the style you are, if you want to have videos or do you want to just read through. And um, yes, so that's a great place place to actually start and whenever you have any questions you could literally raise an issue to us um, and there is a page in the handbook that goes how we do it um, and and we we will respond right away I've got another question that's come through um, from Ben Carter um, our clients use prop monitoring tools like app dynamics uh, will it be possible to integrate with uh, GitLab um, if so, can that be, can we get a unified dashboard? Yeah, so uh, it can be totally integrated to GitLab. Um, now for the unified dashboard, um, what we, um, we, we have the GitLab, uh, it depends on if you want, um, want metrics out of the uh, app dynamic or, or any other tool, uh, the GitLab metrics can, that can have the dashboards and, and we also have an API so, and you can take, in, take that. Now to have the unified dashboard, um, the best probably practice is taking the GitLab API as well as your other uh, tool API and be able to integrate it and have the unified dashboard. That can be fully done. It is not a plugin because we don't know what tools you might be using. It can be integrated, but that can also be uh, created uh, a dashboard because the API is pretty easy to use.
Great, thanks for that. That was the last question. Um, Yanesh, we'll have a team member reach out to you um, for further information. Um, we'll also be following up with everybody that joined uh, the session today with um, the, the link to recording. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Mon, for uh, running through a great presentation. We had heaps of um, great uh, positive feedback along the way. So I appreciate everyone's time. Um, and uh, we are running our next one again next month. So be on the lookout for um, invitation for our next webinar uh, in August. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.